I'm Kelly Siegel, and this is Harder Than Life, a podcast about self-love, self-awareness, business, and health. We tell outrageous stories and boil everything down to simple, practical advice you can start using today. Let's get living. Welcome back to the Harder Than Life podcast. Today's guest is an angel. He has dedicated his life to serving others. We met for lunch because our companies do business together and talked forever, going way over time. I hope the feeling is mutual that I made a lifelong friend. Andrew Stein is the president of the Children's Foundation in Detroit, Michigan, and a true definition of a leader, as well as a living as living an aligned life. Welcome to the Harder Than Life podcast, Andrew. Oh, thanks for having me, Kelly. Great to be here. Uh, this is take two, so I'm super excited. We we tried to do it over uh, remotely over the snowstorm and uh, you know the universe. Uh, there are no coincidences, and I love your energy, and I'm so excited that you're here today it happens to be good friday and the traffic was light and we got to be here and we get to be in person i uh i gotta tell you i i i don't know what it is about you but i love you and i'm so grateful you're here and i'm glad that you're the new um president ceo of the foundation and we're going to do great things together so um glad you're here thank you kelly yeah glad we glad we did this in person changes the energy changes the dynamic if this conversation is anything like our lunch you know get ready. You might be in for like an hour and a half long podcast, folks. I love it. You got the DJ voice. It's the best. So um, your backstory is inspirational, motivating, and literally moves my soul. I am ecstatic to share uh, you with the audience today. Please tell us a story on how you arrived in Michigan to be here today. Yeah. So I'm from Michigan, uh, born and raised in the Detroit area. Grew up, grew up in the suburbs in Franklin, Michigan. Uh, everyone knows the cider mill there. You drive into Franklin. There's the sign that says the town that time forgot. Uh, but family goes back in the Detroit area, four or five generations. You know, but growing up in, here, I always thought of myself as being from Detroit. But I think I had an impression of the city as, uh, you know, a place that you would go for your job or you go for a, a, a sporting event or go to the theater. Um, so I grew up in a little bit of a, of a bubble, to be honest with you. Uh, went to Country Day pretty much my whole life, so bubble within bubble in many ways. Um, great education, feel very privileged for you know the opportunities I had as a kid. I say that the grand irony of my life is that in high school, you had to have enough community service hours every year in order to be able to go off campus for lunch, you know, drive to Tell 12 Mall or whatever for, for lunch. You had to have done a certain number of hours of community service. And my senior year of high school, I couldn't go out to lunch because I hadn't earned my community service hours. <laughs> and it wasn't that, it wasn't that I, I didn't think doing service in the community was important or value it. It's just I, I was 17, 18, and I had other priorities, <laughs> other things that felt important to me at that time. Anyways, went on to Michigan State, loved my time in East Lansing, and then was finishing undergrad and... Um, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Everyone had told me since I was probably eight or nine years old that I should go to law school because I usually had an opinion on things and I was a pretty good writer. And I think to the people who were telling me this, family, friends, you know, being a lawyer was, that was something you could be, right? Uh, so I always had in my head that I, that I guess I'll go to law school. But I was coming out of undergrad and I really didn't want to go to law school. So I started looking for just other things to do. And, and I started by looking at the Peace Corps, right? Lots of people know the Peace Corps. But the idea of moving somewhere in the world, totally unknown, committing two years felt a little daunting. And it was, I remember being in my apartment in East Lansing and I was watching TV and I saw this advertisement uh, for something called City Year. And it was a 30 second spot on Comcast cable that had uh, Dr. King and JFK and all of these historic in, inspirational figures uh, for this thing called City Year. And I didn't know what it was. So I Googled it and I went to the, I, I don't think I Googled it because this was, you know, 2004. <laughs> I probably asked Jeeves it or something like that. <laughs> um, but anyways, went to the website, learned a little bit more, but not so much. And then I get an email from Michigan State saying, um, hey, this organization is going to be on campus doing a presentation. The same, wait, wait, the same organization? So City Year was going to be on campus 
that next week doing a presentation and it happened to be in the classroom where I had class and it was right after my class ended. Wow. There so are li- no coincidences. So literally it's, I, it's like the algorithm, it's like the Facebook or, or the social media algorithms through TV. <laughs> it, it, this was pre algorithm, but you know, they say in marketing, you have to hear things a certain number of times. Well, I got hit. I see this TV ad It prompts me to go to the website, and then I get this email from the university saying someone's going to be on campus doing a presentation. And all I had to do was remain in my – well, I had to go to class, first of all. And then I just had to remain in my seat after class ended. So I did that, and um, a woman walked in. Her name's Nicole Yates. Still friends with her today. I had no idea who she was or why she was walking into my life at that moment in 2004. But she came in, and she did a presentation on on City Year. And what it – what it – is was it it was a call to young people to say um come do a year of service what would our country look like if every young american served their country in some way you can you can join the peace corps and we've got needs all over the globe that you can go help work on uh you could join the military and serve in the military but there ought to be something domestically where young people can do a year of service to help build and improve communities right here in the U.S. And what if every young American had to do that? People from different backgrounds working side by side to help build a stronger country. And it just totally got me at that time. And I said, I'm not going to law school. I'm going to go do this. And so I moved to Washington, D.C., did this for a year. And that is what has set me on the trajectory that I'm on now. So in case the listeners have a pick this up. This man is dedicated to service to others. And, you know, if, if you've listened to any of the podcasts, you listen to any personal development people, that's what this is all about. Giving back. The more you give, the more you receive. And I just, when you sit in a room with this, with you, you just exude it. And, and like I said, at that lunch, I could just feel, and, and, and this is a successful person in all aspects of life. Your, your family, if we're going to get into it, we're going to get into the family and, and everything you do. It's just, I'm honored to, to have you to call you a friend and, and you just to, you just live life the right way. So what does service to others and gratitude mean to you? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. I I think I approached, you know, you you just mentioned and and we talked about this at our lunch, uh, you know, the idea of giving, right? And and giving without expectation of anything in return. <sighs> And, you know, I grew up Jewish and the Jewish word for charity is sadaka. And there's actually different uh, levels of sadaka and each one is more meaningful than the next. And, 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 the, and the deepest, highest form of sadaka is giving to someone that you don't know with zero expectation in return. And um, I think that's how I try to approach relationships is one, I'm genuinely interested in people and curious, and I think that's why we sat for so am I. Uh, for as long as we did at lunch. Well, because- I'm, the, I'm the same way. I, I just I wanted to, I left there, and I'm like, if we didn't have meetings after, we would have probably been there all afternoon. Right, but but as I'm listening to people, I'm I'm thinking of what's a connection point for me, or how my how can I help this person? Is there someone I can introduce them to? Is there a book I can recommend to them? Is there you know, what is our connecting point and how might I be able to make a deposit into what they're doing? Not usually, almost always, not with any thought of what am I going to get out of this, but just knowing that um, if I give to others, it'll come back in some way. I love it. I, I it's You're a mirror to me. Uh, this is the Harder Than Life podcast, and you seem to be making life look easy, as I just said, but it hasn't always been the case. Uh, you lost your mom and your grandmother around the same time. Tell us about that and what you did to cope. Yeah, my mom... So I don't have a big family, and I was in Washington, D.C., moved out there in 2004. I ended up spending 11 years there, right? Got married. We had two of our now three kids moved back to Detroit in 2015. Um, One of the biggest reasons was because we wanted to be closer to family. Uh, And my mom was here and that's really, you know, she was at the heart of family and, you know, being, having kids around their grandma was, was a big priority for us. And I was lucky also to have her mom alive. So my grandma and um, we got, five years with 
my mom, with my grandma. And then November 2019, my mom got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Worst form of cancer you want to have. And it's one of those, you don't, you don't find it until it's too late. But my mom had beat cancer once when I was in high school and she's one of the healthiest people I know and could deal with anything. So, you know, I'm going with her to doctor's appointments. We're figuring out a treatment plan. Uh, she gets a first round of chemo. I think this was late December, early January. So now we're into 2020 mm. and go get some results, some encouraging signs that, you know, things might be working. Uh, and then March 2020 hits and oh, COVID man. hits. I just thought of it. Did she, she, you didn't get to see her when it, when it happened. So uh, my mom got COVID <sighs> in late March, early April. And um, we didn't know what that meant, right? We're obviously scared because this was first couple of weeks of the pandemic. Well, a week or two goes by and she's fine. She had a little cough. She felt a little run down, but otherwise fine. But she keeps testing positive for COVID, which at the time, no one understood why that was. In retrospect, we know now you can have COVID, not be contagious, not be symptomatic, but continue to test positive for months, even though you're not, you know, don't actually have the, have the virus and aren't going to transmit the virus. Well, at that time, nobody knew why this was. So we were calling doctors from Seattle to Germany to try to understand, is it safe for someone to restart chemo? Uh if they've got COVID and there were no answers because this was all so new. Eventually, you know, the disease took over because we weren't, we weren't able to, to get her back on the chemo regimen. And then May, 2020 lost her. And uh, it was the last few months. Couldn't, couldn't see her. Mm. She, my wife was nine months pregnant with our third kid at oh. the time. So, you know, did I want? Did I want to go to the hospital and see her when she was in there? Absolutely. Did I want to come and and see her at her house when she was able to be home and not have to sit on the other side of the room? Hundred percent. But what I knew is that if I walked over there to give my mom a hug, or I walked into that hospital to go visit her when she was there at the end, and she saw me, knowing that I've got a wife at home that's nine months pregnant with her grandson, and she thinks she's got COVID. It didn't matter how bad she was. She was going to get out of that bed and she was going to kill me. Right. <laughs> That's a Jewish mother. right? <laughs> so. I tell you, um, your story just keeps getting better and better and better. And, and it's called the hard life podcast is overcoming hard things. And, and because, you know, adversity is, is part of life. We learn when things get hard. Pain is uh, the portal to happiness. Um, and there was a lot of pain there. So it's well documented you know, my toils with alcohol. Um, why didn't, how were you to talk about the coping mechanisms and skills and habits and, and the daily winning rituals that you use to not slip? I mean, and you had a lot of things thrown at you, Andrew, you could have just said, Oh, I need a drink. And tell me about that. And, and I'm sure some of it had to do with your loving wife and your, and your kids, but there's a lot of people that have that and still choose to drink and, and, take drugs and, and numb. And, and, and I get it, man. It, it's normal. Everybody does it. So talk about your habits because I want everybody to know you're not alone when times get tough. Tough people, or wait, tough times never last. Tough people do. Yeah. A couple things. One is, I, and I get this from my mom, I am, I am pretty even keel. I am married to a, a five foot one Sicilian woman who is the exact opposite, right? Her emotional range is up and down and I'm just kind of hover right around the middle. So I, I'm, I'm blessed with a constitution that kind of keeps me just putting one foot in front of the other. Um, the other thing I'll say is, uh, well, we had a baby a week after my mom passed. So that was an incredible salve to any pain we were feeling but it also could have, but it also could have been overwhelming in terms of just those emotions, right? And 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 the lack of sleep. One thing that that I I will never forget is, I I, I had never really experienced loss like that when when I lost my mom and the outpouring of notes I got from people, texts, emails, calls, posts on Facebook, whatever it was from unexpected people. It all stuck with me and it changed the way that I have 
responded when I've seen other people dealing with loss or dealing with their own stuff. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll see something on social media or you'll hear about someone lost a, a loved one or someone's, you know, just got a, got a tough diagnosis. And you think, you know, yeah, I know them and they know me, but they don't really need to hear from me. Like they're dealing with their own stuff. I, I haven't talked to them in 10 years, whatever it is. But it's actually notes from those type of people that almost meant the most to me because it, I knew I was going to hear from those that were in my inner circle, but hearing from others, hey, I lost my my dad or et cetera, uh, just was really helpful to me and changed the way I've thought about how I will communicate with people as I see them dealing with their own stuff. Ah, uh, you, you're remarkable. This is this is so good. Um, I am shaking because my relationship with my mother was just the opposite, and I love love and I love to hear about strong women doing strong things and I'm, I'm trying to raise a strong woman she's 14 and thinks she's, she's 30 so yeah we'll have to get our, our kids together it'll be fun um but I love hearing that story and and I'm sorry that I, but that talk about that that roller coaster you have the most influential person in your life pass away and then boom there comes which which uh, child was born at that time? Yeah, so I got I have three kids. I have a almost thirteen year old, an eight year old. So girl, boy, and then we had a we had a boy, June twenty twenty. So literally a couple weeks after my mom passed, a freaking roller coaster. His name's Caleb. He'll be three in this upcoming June. So with. God giveth, God taketh away. Exactly. Um, and it's just, I find it ironic that here we are, two Jewish men in on Good Friday, which we all know what Good Friday is. It's, you know, we just came off of Passover. You know, some say that the Last Supper was a Passover Seder. And... Um, <laughs> just, just, Did you have a Seder, Kelly? Yeah, it was it was law and arduous, man. We we had a good time. My my We were at my uncle's house, and it was full of love, I don't know. Things are different these days, Andrew. I, I'm just not the same guy I was a, a, a week ago. I wasn't the same guy that I, that I was years ago. It's just life is, I keep saying this over and over. It sounds like a broken record. It's, this isn't a dress rehearsal. This is real deal. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm finally in my life living it and just loving it and connecting with people. I've loved people for a long time, but I was afraid to give love. I was afraid to receive love and I was afraid to share my feelings and what was really going on. And then I, I, I miss out on connections like this and, and I'm not going to do it again. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have, we're going to do some big things together. I, you know, I want to plug uh, May 6th too, and we're going to do more. We're going to keep talking about it because we've got to keep repeating it. Uh, May 6th, talk about, it's a great, great time. I've went every single year. You have an event for the Children's Foundation coming up. Talk about that. Yeah, so I, you know, I started a couple months ago as as the new president of the Children's Foundation, and um, you know, we support kids' health and wellness in the area. And one of the big projects that we helped put together, really spearheaded in partnership with with some really generous families and organizations in town, was the opening of what's called the Adolescent Addiction Recovery Center. So this is a this is going to hit home for you Kelly. This is a a space in the Children's Hospital in Troy. So if you know that building on Big Beaver, it looks it's like beautiful. a yeah, it looks like a big Lego block. Um, there is now a new clinic that is in that space that is specifically for young people who are dealing with addiction challenges and substance use disorder. And so, um, you know, prior to the opening of this clinic, there really wasn't anything like this in this community. I think of the people that I knew growing up who were dealing with substance use challenges. And, you know, if, you're, if your family had resources, you were looking at places in Arizona or out in the mountains or even, you know, out of the country, Costa Rica, stuff like that. And I, I, I don't even know the cost to send your kid to those sort of treatment centers. But if... But if you didn't have those resources, there really weren't a ton of options in this community. Um, you know, you could you could go to your pediatrician, but they don't know how to handle these situations. So now this clinic is open, and um, we it's it's run by a psychiatrist who is from the Detroit area, but was living in Colorado, and addiction is his area of expertise, and so he's back home with his wife, his kids, he's, this is his dream is running this clinic. It's open. And because it's 
uh, because of the philanthropic commitment of the Children's Foundation and our other partners who have who have come on board to fund this with us, it's free to anyone regardless of insurance status. And so uh, May 6th, because I want to get to the event, May 6th, we're, we're doing our annual, it's called Derby for Kids. This is a, a, a fundraising event, the day of the Kentucky Derby. It's at the Country Club of Detroit. Um, going to have 500 people there. I've, this is going to be my first year. What I've been told first and foremost is this is a fun event. I've met the planning committee. There's no doubt in my mind this is going to be a really fun event. But more importantly, it's raising the money that's going to support this clinic so that it can be open for any young person who's dealing with substance use can go and get the get the help they need. Well, I've been to every one of them, and they're fantastic. I'll be there. Uh, it's, it is a great event. There's the link to buy the uh, tickets will be in the show notes. We're going to air this rather quick to, to make sure that we, we uh, make awareness of that. And yes, it does hit home. You saw me shaking right away. I grew, many of my friends from high school uh, or all childhood grew up and are, are addicted to something or have passed from said addiction. There is no resource. I grew up in South Warren. We're very, very, very poor. So it is an honor to hear that. And what I love specifically is, did you say that was a therapist, run by a therapist or a psych, what'd you call him? So sorry, it, 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 there is a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. So, so, so there's a doctor there and then he's got a therapist who specializes also in addiction. So he sees kids as does the therapist. They've got a, a great office manager. And then, you know, as they grow, they have the capacity to add more therapists and, and, and see more young people. So it's well documented about my overcoming addiction, poverty, violence, what the book's called, Harder Than Life, by the book, by the way, just plug. Um, how I was able to do it was overcoming the, 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 the psychoanalysis of what was bothering me that made me drink. It's not, you're not addicted to drinking, you're not addicted to alcohol, you're addicted to numbing whatever childhood trauma that you have. And it's good to hear that they have therapists and a psych, uh, psychiatrist to address that because right. that's the root of what addiction is. So if anybody's listening to this, you know this is a very good cause. Please get involved. And um, I've never shared this in my book, but you know, I walked in on my dad shooting up. And, mm. and, and that's, you would think that I would have learned my lesson. My dad eventually passed away from drugs and alcohol. You would think I would learn my lesson. I, I can, when I say that, I don't, I remember walking in, I was maybe 10 years old and I was tiptoeing in the house to be quiet and just sh sh surprise my dad. And boy, did I surprise him. You know, it's, you don't ever want to walk in and see a needle in someone's arm, nobody's arm that you mm -hmm. love. And it gives me the, the, the willies thinking about it right now. So when you tell me that there's a, a way to the, the three, obviously one, your charity is one of the charities that the heart of the life is going to donate to our goal this year is to donate 150 grand, 50 grand to each charity. Two of them are children's charities. One of them is yours. The third one is an, is a, um, an addiction center as well. So you're tugging on my heart and I love that. And you have our full support. We, we NTM is, has traditionally donated, uh, and sponsored, we will do the same this year, um, and we will be there, and we're looking forward to it. Is the what is the ex most exciting three minutes in in history? Oh uh, yeah, the they, Derby, right? They call it. Yeah. And it's funny because you go there and you eat and you're having a good time. Everybody's dressed beautifully and everybody's smoking cigars, and it's just a great time. And then the Derby goes off, and it's done in three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, the the thing I'm stressing about Kelly is the dress because everyone keeps telling me, I look, I don't own. I don't own a seersucker jacket. I don't wear a bow tie. I don't have a hat. I wear, my staff has gotten to know me the last couple of months and they're like, look, Andrew, you cannot wear uh, gray, blue, or, you know, brown to this. Buy something with a little splash of color. So, well, go see, go see our friends um, downtown uh, Birmingham. Uh, it's where I got Caccini. They're yeah. great. They're great. Uh, I have some great color. I, I, I usually wear some fancy colored suit to, to these, all these events right, I'm going to try something crazy. But let me say one other thing, because it, since this clinic opened in November, and I think your book, your podcast is also helping. One of the biggest issues around substance use is, is stigma. People don't talk about it. It affects so many more people and families than people realize. And since this clinic has opened, uh, the number of people who have, reached out and said, my son, my daughter, my niece, my nephew, my brother, my sister, whoever, uh, 
is dealing with this with this with this issue and this clinic really means a lot whereas before they just wasn't talked about right there's a generational shift happening but it's also it's you it's your book it's saying look this is a clinic for people dealing with addiction it reduces the stigma and 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 makes people realize they're not dealing with this alone we have a um we have a a, a family and a partner at the foundation called the called the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So this is Ken and Lisa Daniels and, and their family lost their son, lost their son to a, to a, um, to an overdose, and it was uh, you know heartbreaking. And they turned their pain into action. And have created this fund at the Children's Foundation to support substance use. So they're one of the big philanthropic partners that have committed to to making this clinic a reality. Um, but they are so brave in getting up and talking about what happened and telling Jamie's story. Um, and that then gets other people to realize the more we talk about this, acknowledge that this isn't something that, you know, you, that it's something that affects so many families and that, uh, you know, there's a way to, to turn your pain into action to prevent this from happening to the next family. Well, it doesn't go away. So I'm, I'm going to go on a rant for a second because that's why I created this. It's literally is to create awareness. The first chapter of my book is self-awareness. If you are asking yourself questions about why things are happening to you and you're taking substances, it is unhealthy and you need to get help. I'm available. I get messages every single day. I, I love that this, this, this gives me more resources. I would love an introduction to the, to the head person. So we'll, we'll have them on the podcast but there are resources. You are not alone. You matter and you're loved. And that's why I'm so glad you're here. We're, we're going to have, we're going to have some fun and, and raise some money for a very good cause. Thank that you. is such a good cause. I plugged that a little bit in between and, and I stole our next question be, because we were talking about it, but I'm, I'm going to go back to it. Uh, there's so much talk into the world today about emotional intelligence, being able to respond and not react which we're all guilty of, especially me, you quite possibly might be the most even killed person I know. I literally wrote that too, by the way, before you <laughs> before said Before I so said I it, it, yeah. What's your secret? I don't know. Uh, I don't feel that way with my kids. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm going to steal. My daughter can trigger me faster than anybody else in the world. She, I dropped her off at school yesterday and, and I said, I don't know what's going on with you, but I'm feeling all your negative energy. And I said, if you walk into school, I said, I love you. But if you walk into school and you start, people start treating you bad at the party this morning, it's your energy. Yeah. And she looked at me and she's like, I love you so much, dad. And, and it, she's like, I don't know what's wrong, but I'll figure it out. And so it's all a part of this. So tell me about your kids. Oh, um, so we got a daughter, like I said, almost 13. I mean, how do they trigger you? Oh, how do they trigger uh, me? How do they, how are you not even killed emotionally intelligent? Put your shoes on, put your shoes on, put your shoes on, put your shoes on, <laughs> right? That's, I could see you yell. <laughs> um, wait, wait, wait. That's a, so a lot, I, I read a, an internet amount like you do, and a lot of what people recommend now is that we kind of l- stop being the hover parent. And, and, and I'm not saying that's hovered but constantly pushing them. So I, I have to tell my daughter, and she's going to kill me when she hears this, to take showers. She's 14 years old and she doesn't feel anything. She's going through the body changes. Baby, you need to shower. Baby, you need to shower. And then I went, you know what? I just didn't, I didn't do it. And then her face broke out and I looked at her and I said, you realize this is because you didn't shower. And you just got to let them kind of experience and feel their way through mm, life. Yeah. And let them, you know, you're not going to let them hurt themselves, but you let them fall. And, yep. stumble. And, and all too often, you know, we don't, I definitely don't want my daughter to have to go through what I went through. It, yeah. it, what I went through was horrible. And, and, and I'm not trying to, oh, what was me? It's just, it was, it was horrible. She get, I get to relive my childhood through her. So I, I am a little bit more protective than I want to be. So I've been trying to back up. So tell me how. Well, here's, here's what I think my issue is because yes, I'm even keel. And yes, that helps me in some situations. I can, I can. I can handle tough information and process it and and respond in a way that's non-reactionary. And that, I think, helps me out in the world, in the workplace in some ways. But, you know, it comes with wanting things around me to feel calm and in control as well. And then you you put three kids in an environment and it's anything but. It's chaos, right? And, and a Sicilian woman? Right. Yeah. So, and... um. 
so I try to be mindful of that. You know, I'm, 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 I'm big on mindfulness and, and being aware of how I'm reacting and how I'm feeling. And, and I remember reading a study right around the time my oldest was born where they asked people in their 60s, 70s, 80s to reflect back on their lives and identify the times where they felt the happiest. And then separately, they asked them to reflect back on their lives and identify the times that they felt the most out of control, chaotic, weren't sure about what was going to happen, just anxious about their life, out of control of their own life. And what they found is that those two periods of time overlapped almost entirely. Wow. Right? So these times where... The kitchen's a mess. The kid stuff is everywhere. You're telling one kid to do their homework, the other kid to take a shower, whatever it is. Uh, it actually isn't going to get any better than this, right? And so you think you're just trying to manage and get through, but to what end? Like it's, it's not going to, this is the best time of my life. And I try to remind myself that, that I'm, I'm going to, there's going to be a day where I actually miss all this chaos in my house. So try to have an appreciation for it now. And I see so many, you know, cause I'm not that much younger than you, but I'm a little bit hey. younger, <laughs> uh, but I've got all my friends are, are with kids, you know, two to, to 10 or so. I was, I was the first to have kids. So, so my 13 year old's a bit of an outlier, but, uh, I see people who are, just trying to manage. And every time I'm with them and I talk to them, how's it going? The answer is, oh, we're so busy. Oh yeah, what's what's so busy? Oh, soccer and swimming and dance class. And I'm like, okay, what else? Uh, well, you know, there's work. And, and it's like, they're just describing their life. But what I see them doing, and, and I know I do this, but I try to be aware of it so I'm not doing as much. It's like, Life is not something to just be managed because what do you, what, what are you trying to get to? Right? Like you, you gotta have some awareness <laughs> at the death. moment. Yeah. We're race to death. Right. That makes and, no sense. And, and embrace it. So I, when I'm feeling like I'm out of control with my kids, I try to, I try to remind myself of that, but it's not easy. Uh, you know, it's why I call it harder than life. Uh, you gotta be harder than life. What you're really saying is to be present, uh, and then I always say that you get to, you don't have to. I get to take my daughter to dance every Monday. I get to uh, take her to school every day. I get to pick her up every day. That's I'm, I'm lucky that NTM, my, my IT company, allows me the freedom. My leadership team allows me the freedom to be able to do that. Um, I love that. Just the, that little language shift in your brain and how that then probably changes how you feel when you have to go do that stuff. And I also say things, I have a full day. I don't say I'm busy. I have a full day and every day is full, but I love who I'm becoming every single day and every freaking day, Andrew, I am learning something and I'm loving something and I'm enjoying the process. And it's just day tight compartments. Yesterday is yesterday. I can't do anything about it. All I can do is good things today to win today and do it tomorrow. And then over, and then you, that's how you build a great life. You know what you're doing it right now. I'm trying. I don't know. <laughs> All right. I, you just teed it up. I got to ask you, I'm going to skip down a couple of questions. Define happiness then. Oh man. That's, mm. a, that's a tough one. I, this for you, man. Just, it's just what you think. There's no right or wrong answer. Cause there really is no true definition. It's what you think. And believe me, if you're winning the way you are and you're happy, this is happiness. Yeah. I mean, professionally, I feel I feel happy when I know my work is is tied to something meaningful and I know that the people around me are really excited and happy to show up to work and feel that same meaning, right? I, I, I am unsettled if I think that there is someone that I'm working with that doesn't like their job and is is dreading feels really low Sunday at five o'clock because they've got to go to work that next week. And if I sense someone's feeling that way, I am like, have this insatiable need to try to help them. Oh, we got to deviate. I'm going to cut in. What have you, just, I can tell that you, you care. 
and you have compassion. That's the word I'm looking for. Compassion, like I've never seen before. It's remarkable. It's you're amazing. Um, what have you found? There's always a correlation. There's always a common denominator. When you when someone's upset, we talked about somebody bef- before. You know, we don't need to name names, but usually, you know, one of the four agreements, which was the books that we've talked about, is don't take anything personal. It's never usually work. What have you found? A commonality. Something that has shown up with a person who has, in, in all of your career, doesn't have to be where we're at now. Just have you seen something that's come up time after time where this is happening and it creates uh, a problem with that person at work? I don't know if this is the most common reason, but I think this is a reason that doesn't always get talked about at work, which is that sometimes people just don't want to be doing their job anymore, but they don't think they can bring that up with their employer, right? And because they're scared of what that might mean. But when you can open the door and you say to someone, hey, I, how are you doing? I'm okay. Yeah, you know, I'm sort of notice. You don't seem to be yourself or, uh, and then you start to ask them like, what do you want to do? <laughs> and they feel comfortable about being able to talk about their own career ambitions or their own life ambitions uh, that maybe are separate from their current place of employment, but they have that trust and they feel that security to be able to talk about it. And then you learn, okay, this person really is just really wants to go back to school to do something totally different or is, has sort of hit the end of their road with this current position and doesn't necessarily see something else for them there. So they've been looking and then you say, great, like, you know, you don't kick them out the door. You say, let's talk about how we can help get you where you want to be. Um, again, just looking for opportunities to give to people. So, so I don't know if that's the most common thing that, that will. That's fantastic. Give. What you said was be vulnerable and have the tough conversation. We're, we're I don't know where it got the, oh, I'm going to fire you. Right. You don't want to be here? Go to, get out. Man, I, I don't know. Hey, I got a newsflash. Even on the best days, I kind of want to be doing podcasting. I, I really like this connecting. I love my IT family. I, I crave being around them, but I love this. Yeah. And and so I'm going to start working where I'm doing that less and this more. We have that conversation, but we're extremely vulnerable at the yeah. So vulnerability is cool, man. And and really, if anything out of this pandemic that may have come, we, we, we are talking together. Maybe it's not so productive, but we're at least communicating. Um, I think we need to be a lot kinder to each other. And I think be truthful and be vulnerable because when there are outstanding leaders like you, it's safe. It's safe to come to Andrew and say, hey, I really want to go and work at the uh, at the Troy Addiction Center. Right. Can, can, you, can you help me get there? And the answer is going to be, um, heck yeah. You know, let's get you happy because that's really fulfilling your dream, helping someone fulfill their dream. Oh, it just gives me the willies, the right, butterflies. Right. So um, you just keep getting better and better. Uh, all right, we're going to dig into some personal things because we, we've gone there. Uh, th- there's a big buzz around boundaries these days. It seems as if the definition of a healthy boundaries is convoluted. Share one business non-negotiable and one personal and, and see what I did there boundaries and non-negotiables they're also known standards so we kind of talked about it but dig into that a little bit deeper like what when I read that letter that you sent out to the to introduce yourself that you laid out a standard of excellence you laid out what is tolerated what's not talk about that and then also talk about it with the kids and the, and the family too because you really do have everything balanced <laughs> and you are giving me way too much credit, but I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. I, uh, so you're referring to, it was the Friday before I started in this new job and I didn't know, I had met some of the staff members, but I didn't know most of the team that I would be meeting that following Monday and they didn't know me. And I just on a whim a week or so before just started working on what i titled a user manual <laughs> and it I think at one point it was you know three or four pages I trimmed it down to one or two but it was here are some of the essential things that you ought to know about me first of all showing my own vulnerability right, so I was just gonna say vulnerability so see you are ugh. 
Um, practice what you preach and you you drink the Kool-Aid. Showing my own vulnerability, trying to uh, establish, and, and, and this is... This is my number one non-negotiable is, is trust. Like that is my highest value personally, professionally. Um, it is the, it is the foundation on which everything else is built. And I, I said to the, to the staff in this user manual, I sent them the Friday before, which probably freaked some people out in retrospect. Some people probably liked it. Some people I loved it. I love uh, it. it I got, that's where I got the, your mother and your grandmother. Yeah. From. I, I, you know, I read it. So you did. So, um, but I said, I said, trust is my highest value. I said, I'm quick to give you my trust. Um, I recognize that others aren't as quick to give their trust back to me. So I'm willing to work for your trust. My favorite line, by the way. Yeah. Uh, because it's true. It's very true. And you know, I look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a white guy who grew up in the suburbs, right? Like I, I have existed in a world where I can walk into situations and um, trust is, is, I don't know, I don't, my privilege has allowed me to live in a world where, you know, I, I've been able to trust people because things have turned out, right, like in the way that I thought they would. But if you live in a world where promises are made and broken by family, by community, by, you know, society and the systemic factors that you know treat different people differently which is which is inequitable and unfair you know then you're going to grow up and trust is going to be harder for you to give right tell me about it um so so i what i said is violate my trust and i'm always going to give you a second chance but third chance fourth chance if i don't feel like i can trust you then that's going to be really hard for us to have the relationship that I want to have, whether you're someone I'm working with, whether you're a board member or a donor of ours, or whether you're someone in my, in my personal life. And so I say that to my kids all the time, just number one thing, tell me the truth. Yeah, right. <laughs> mine is, so it's, this is why we connect so well, because mine is honesty. Yep. And it's, it's the near cousin of truth and it all stems together because, you know, uh, we can fix anything but death. And I can't fix anything when I don't know the whole story. And I don't even know where to start. Yeah. So uh, I hate dealing with things without the facts. But uh, yeah, just just tell us the truth. And, and the truth hurts once. <laughs> a lie hurts forever. And then sugarcoating it doesn't help anybody. Right. Mm. Mm, that's so good. Now you got to be careful. I, I did this once with my son where I noticed this He there was just this this really bad, almost cave drawing dug into a piece of wood on our wall in our in our home. And I know who did it. <laughs> and I asked my middle son, Damon, Damon, did, did you do this? No. Damon, did you do this? No. Damon, don't lie to me. I'm not going to get mad. Did you do it? Yeah, I did it. I can't believe you did that. Uh, oh, so that's, that's the hardest. I thing. violated his trust, right? Like yeah. I asked him to trust that I wasn't going to get upset. And then I didn't honor that. So, But the inverse of that is true too. Somebody feels like, oh, I told you the truth. So I should be forgiven. No, we yeah. still have to be held accountable. It's true. I, I trust for me. You would think with my upbringing is it would be the hardest thing to earn for me. But I, I, I feel like you you have to give it to get it back and people say you know you're silly for trusting look at their track record and, and i have formed some very very deep friendships with people that have never been trusted before mm. because they haven't given it so they were given it unconditionally and then i that's why i have so many friends i have friends of all different walks of life and people like why are your friends with that he does this and it's I don't, I don't have that relationship with them. Yeah. We have a different relationship yeah. because I come at it with eyes wide open, trusting them. Now somebody breaks that trust two and three and four times and I'm the same way. It's okay with well, this. This is, I'm, I'm good to walk away, yeah. but there's no other way. You know, I, I, it's faith over fear. Why? If you go into it fearing, it's going to happen. Right. So why not go in and say, Hey, the good things are going to happen. Let's do these things together. And, and, I'm going to tell you right now, watch out because it, miracles happen. Um, I'm excited to see the team, your team, because I, I the, your predecessor was amazing. He kind of let people do their thing and, and soar where they want, where you're going to, it seems like you're kind of bringing everyone together and building an, an even stronger unit, uh, a team, so to speak, a family. 
that's that's one of my core values family i didn't have a family man yeah i i the people that i was supposed to trust violated that trust mm. over and over to the point where they tried to kill me multiple times it's amazing that i do trust people but i just found when i was with a chip on my shoulder and didn't i didn't get the results that i got now yeah. i get now and i would never be able to have you here connecting with you and, and man we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do some things together i, I want to i gotta meet this family um what what gets you down and then when you get down what gets you happy again i can be brought down by like i will look at a situation and analyze it from a hundred different angles right and uh I'll take risks, but I want to know what those risks are to the best of our ability. Like I'm, I'm not a, I'm definitely a look before you leap. Right. And, and this applies to everything in my life, like a big work decision or, um, a product I'm going to buy. Right. Like I don't buy something unless I've researched the hell out of it, which is kind of annoying at times, but I like to understand, like, you know, I like to look at things from, from, from every potential angle. But once we decide, once we decide we're going to do something, uh, thinking mostly in a work setting and we know the risks, there are risks in everything we do, but we know what those risks are. We've talked about them. Let's just all go at it, right? We've got maximum input. Now let's get maximum unity. I am bogged down when people will just continue to bring up the, but what about, but what about, but what about? And it's, yeah, no, 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 we've, let's get that on the table. But once we've got it on the table and we figured out, okay, that might be an issue we hit, but we still think this is worth pursuing. Um, then, then we're good. But to continue to, I, I am bogged down by people who are, um, it's constantly glass half full. Um, it's constantly, but what about the risk? No, no, that's actually glass half empty. Glass half empty, sorry, yes. And then um, uh, I think probably the term for that is just like cynicism. I think oh. I'm bogged down by cynicism. I swear I think you're my little brother. Where did you come from? I feel the same way. And what EO, we run EOS at our office, and I say, let's focus on the 80%, 80-20. So all too often the what ifs and what the, the, the naysayers and the, the things that they were are, are 20%. And really most of the time it's 5%. So let's focus on the 95 that we know is going to happen and let's not worry about the five. And uh, that's got us on track. And I keep reminding them and keep reminding them. And I, I, I always, you'll hear me say this all the time. So I, I put the bumpers up like, like in uh, bowling, mm -hmm. put the bumpers up. We're going to stay right here. We're not going three lanes down. We're going to stay in our lane. And, and EOS provides us a structure of that. And some people are just nervous. And, and, you know, for me, you grew up with lots of love and lots of trust. For me, I grew up with no trust and no love. So, but I have persevered and I trust myself emphatically. I know if I make a bad decision, which I will, I know it, I make a lot of them. Uh, I trust my team and myself to make the decisions to get us out of it quickly. I'm not going to throw uh, more capital or anything towards a bad decision mm -hmm. i'm good at cutting my losses and moving to the next thing and, and it's going to happen especially if you're taking risks yeah so that's uh <laughs> we just keep teeing these things up and realizing that how similar we are so i love this and this is people are gonna get gems out of this this is you know if you're that person uh you want to just look deep and and figure out where in your childhood you were second guessed and and know that it's this fixable so define success for me in your words You know, I, I think I decided a few times in my career that, you know, success to me is uh, satisfying basic financial needs is, is, is important, but it's not my measure of success. Otherwise, you know, I would have, would have never walked the path that I'm on right now. Um, success for me is, is really feeling like I'm waking up every day with a purpose and that that purpose is, is worthwhile. It's the type of thing that I'll be able to look back on, um, in my career and feel like, yeah, I spent 40, 50, 60 hours a week, Monday through Friday doing something that, uh, wasn't just about me. Um, and then being able to do that along with people, I could never be a 
solo practitioner of anything. <laughs> it would, I would be drained, right? Like I, I'm an extrovert. Every personality test I've taken, I, I get energy being around other people. When I'm on my own, I'm in my head too much and I feel like my energy level is dipping. So, um, you know, doing meaningful work with other people is success to me. You know, if, 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 if people look back on the three, five, 10 years that we worked together and, and they can say that was among some of the most meaningful work of my life, well, that would be awesome. So that, the, the introvert versus extrovert conversation, we're going to have another time, but I always find that very fascinating. People think that, oh, if I, I get in a situation, I get drained. I'm an, I'm an introvert. I, I don't find, I get, you know, energy is expended when you're in rooms and, and whatnot. I, I was at the Tigers game at last night opening day and I, afterwards I was exhausted. I mean, I, I must've shook hands with 550 people. Yeah. You know, it's, I don't go out much anymore. So I was out and about and saw a bunch of old, old friends and good friends and, it, it, it's, it wears on you, especially when you see people drinking and and a little bit excess. It just, that wears on me. Mm-hmm. So I hate to see suffering. Suffering is optional. Pain is is, is inevitable. inevitable. But yeah. suffering is optional. Mm-hmm. Um, I hate to see people suffering. And, God, almost 100% of it is self-imposed. And it's in your mind. You said mindfulness. So sorry about that. Um I know the answer to this and we're about to land the plane. We're going to grant. We're going a little bit longer because this has been just so good. Um, if you had all the money in the world, but still had to work, what would you be doing and why? Uh, giving it out. <laughs> uh, I'm so, this is, this new role for me is so exciting because, um, you know, we get to support good work in the community that's helping kids, whether that's, uh, research happening at children's hospital that's helping kids who are dealing with cancer or it's uh, a really great after school program that is going to is going to help the kids who are participating put them on a on a give them a little more confidence a little more resiliency um feel have them feel like they've got a, a mentor in their life whatever those 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 little ways that you're that you're going to help kids reach their full potential regardless of the background they're coming from. And the fact that we get to resource that work because it all takes money to happen is such a a dream position and privilege for me. What I think makes us, you know, the children's foundation is different than uh, some of the other big foundations in town, right? We're not the, we're not the Gates foundation. (laughs) We're not, uh, this is not one individual or one family that has made their wealth and now created a foundation. This is a the children's foundation is made up of hundreds of no, actually thousands of individuals in this community that have contributed their capital towards kids health and wellness. And so, and, and we get to be the stewards of those resources to guide them to make the greatest impact on kids. So this is, it's, it's making impact. It's, it's helping work on the ground, but it's doing it in this way where I get to um, bring along those with resources to help them realize the difference that, that they can make and hopefully find some meaning and, and, um, and intentionality around their, their own giving and, one of the things that you're going to see, and it, cause I, 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 you know, NTM and, and Kelly Siegel sponsors a lot for, for you. And we, it's, it, this isn't a normal charity. This isn't a normal nonprofit. Every single event is fun. The summer recess party is one of the best. I, not, I wouldn't miss it for the world. It is a group of everybody that comes together for that cause. And everybody's happy. We've all been to these charity events and it's, a silent auction and a, or, or an auction. And it's, I mean, literally they are there to separate you from your money. Mm. These events are everybody coming together to have fun and just doing it for a good reason. Yeah. So I highly, it's an early plug, but summer recess, I believe it's going to be at the M one concourse yep. again. Yep. Best time ever. 
I went last year and had a blast and, and, and you know, we'll be there this year again. Um, again, May 6th Derby for kids. I'm also going to say one time to May 23rd, you have to go to Dunkin' Donuts, get an iced coffee. And for that day, you, there, everything's being donated to, to your organization. Yeah. Huge shout out. Thank you to all the, uh, the Dunkin' Donuts, uh, stores in the area if you buy an iced coffee on may 23rd so hopefully it's a, it's a warm day the, the proceeds of that are going to go to uh to the children's foundation so and you can hear what they're doing great things you know i do feel like we should give a acknowledgement to your predecessor larry burns yeah i, I tell you his leadership skills were phenomenal and he you talk about trust a very dapper gentleman i love him dearly um enjoyed our conversations i'm enjoying our conversation too i just it's just just been an honor it's, there are no coincidences i got referred by a friend to come in and here i am and larry burns you did a great job you you turned over a, um, a gem to andrew and then i expect you to do great things with it no pressure yeah exactly <laughs> two Thank more you. questions and we're gonna land the plane and get out of here and these are fun gonna then and i cannot wait to hear your answers if you could create one law in the universe what would it be and why one law in the universe. Well, and, and how about you can make it in the country. One okay. law, how about one law for America that all we all had to follow? My uncle just said to me, he's like, why don't you start telling people when you're going to ask that? Because I don't ask it every time. He's like, you need to tell them because it's, it's, it's hard to think about it. Yeah, well, you know, there's the, there's the what's actually possible versus you know no. i get to wave a magic wand that, kinda, i like the magic question. wand because it tells me about you i know but i'm the practical even keel <laughs> guy so of course i think about what's practical honestly if, if i think back to what i did at, at you know 22 right and finished college and went and did city year and what i, I spent a year working in the schools in washington dc on a team of 10 other people and we were all totally different from each other different races, ethnicities, religions, sexual orientations, gender identities, where we were coming from in the world. And we found commonality and built relationships that, uh, but for that experience, our paths would have never crossed. So it, I, think, I think we need, we have a major empathy gap in this world. And I think that is the root of a lot of our problems is that we don't want to support and uplift and, 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 and help each other because we don't know each other if you're different, right? And there's tons of studies that show this. Like you are way more inclined to support a policy um, that, that helps someone with a disability or someone who's a member of the LGBTQ community if you can identify a specific person that you know is a member of that group, even if you're not. Well, I know that. And so like when in the world we all live in our own bubbles, right? And so when in the world do you interact with people? But when you do, the relationships that are formed make you a more thoughtful and empathetic person. So my law, my magic wand would just be um, that there are more opportunities uh, where people from different backgrounds are forced to come together and like get to know each other and work on stuff. Heck, you just described my fraternity at Western. <laughs> sure. I sort I, I, that's, I grew up very, very poor, very distinct who I was surrounded myself with. And it was one, it was a poor chip on your shoulder person. When I went to college, I joined a fraternity and I met people from all different walks of life. And that was a sh culture shock. Mm. What you're saying is an absolute must. I'd take it a step further and, and, and think after you graduate, you should go travel the world yeah, right. and see how good we have it here in America and then figure out a way to make a difference and give back and stop being so selfish. Yeah. Now, do I think everybody's selfish? No. And I'm not saying self care, putting yourself, your, your, your personal development and your, your, your peace first is not selfish. That's not, uh, that, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying constantly stepping on other, other people and not advancing your being. Well, the older you get, your capacity for empathy goes down, right? Like kids, think of how empathetic a five-year-old is, right? Uh, oh, God, we, we lose that over time if we don't, if, if it's not a mental muscle that we exercise. So it's, it's society. We're putting it on them. It's, it's, that's what you're right. A, a, a five-year-old is 
naturally empathetic and then they become hardened because of their 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 surroundings their parents their social media now oh, don't get me started on that so i i i think i heard you say like, be of service yeah. and and be more empathetic so that's that's a good one i i was just mine's simple just just you got to tell the truth yeah this it's make life so much easier Last question, and we'll we'll recap the uh, the events that we want because this is going to air quickly. If you could have dinner with one person that is alive or dead, who would it be, and why? You mentioned uh, Martin Luther King. Yeah, you know, I, I, there's there's some of the great orators. I mean, there's some of the I I read all of Martin Luther King's biographies. I, I'm fascinated by him. I'm far fascinated by Winston, Winston Churchill. Mm-hmm. Be able to lead during the war. Was just. Uh, Did I tell you there's a whole room in my mom's house dedicated to Winston Churchill? This is my. My, no. my stepfather has this unbelievable Winston Churchill collection that was here, there, and everywhere until he married my mom. And my mom organized it in, a, in, a, in his office in the house. So you walk in, and the first room there is all Winston Churchill stuff. Anyways, if you ever want to go learn about Winston I, Churchill. I was fascinated with him because on yeah. his birthday, he woke up with a cigar and a scotch. Yeah. It's like, yeah. whoa. Love it. So again, dinner with one person. Ah, oh, there's so many, but you know, it'd be interesting. You mentioned Dr. King, and is an obvious answer. But um, I, I, we all know his speeches, right? But I would really be interested in like what the other ninety five percent of his day looked like, and the blocking and tackling of community organizing and. Um, I have a mentor who uh, is one of the people that helped taught me how to be an effective fundraiser in the nonprofit space. And he would always say, you know what Dr. King spent the majority of his time doing fundraising. You don't read about that, but like, you know, what was his approach to really get people uh, motivated to give the resources that it took to, you know, organize the way he did and, and maybe picking his brain on, on, on some of those topics about how he approached the internal leadership of, of, you know, the civil rights work that he did. I just want to know how he got so positive. Mm. So when I read his, uh, I read two of his biography, biographies, I think it was two of them written by somebody obviously. And they, after every time something would happen, I'd stop and I'd say, well, how would I react to this? Mm-hmm. And his, view was just and then the way he would orate it was so eloquent and uh, and like I, this guy mesmerizes me uh you know there's, there's good people like that there's you know bill clinton was that way um ronald reagan was that way um there the, matthew mcconaughey is that way right now um the rock or dwayne johnson is like that just they're just they say things with energy and vavoom and but his was he is the grand poobah of mm-hmm. everybody. The only other person I can think of is maybe Ed Milet. I mean, it just it's, it's just so you you can connect with everything he says, no matter who you are, mm-hmm. no matter what. I love that. That's a great answer. This has been absolutely wonderful, and I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I want to again tell me the two dates. Those are there in your words. Yeah, so May 6th is the Derby for Kids. Uh, that That's our big event to raise money for and the... That's at the Country Club of Detroit? It's at the Country Club of Detroit, yep. Uh, you can you can go to yourchildrensfoundation.org, find information about both the Derby and May 23rd, get your iced coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. It's the best iced coffee anyway, so if you're an iced coffee drinker, I will, find a Dunkin'. Uh, I will do a post that day to support. I will see you at uh, the Derby for Kids. I love you. Thank you for coming in. And I, this is just the beginning of a lifelong friendship. Thank you. I want to remind you each and every episode is sponsored by National Technology Management, the easiest and best IT company to do business with. Delivering peace of mind with technology every day. Visit trustntm.com for more information. And until next week, be harder than life. Thank you for listening. Please rate and subscribe to Harder Than Life. And let's take this to the next level. Get connected at the links below.